an enclave in the Arab world, Israel was admitted to the United Nations. The Arab representatives walked out in protest. But Abba Eban had come to stay. Still, the Israeli government refused to let the Palestinian refugees return to their homes. Like the Jews before them, the camp generation had lost everything save its sense of identity. It would invest in education and resistance to survive. At the same time, Israel was organizing airlifts to bring in Jews from Iraq, Yemen and the Maghreb. Meeting in London in 1950, the Western powers decided to limit arms sales to Israel and the Arabs to protect the existing borders. The Arabs felt isolated. The United States was acting on President Truman's doctrine of containing communism. Having rebuffed Stalin's advances since 1945, Turkey became part of NATO in 1952. Its new Prime Minister, Adnan Menderes, was on good terms with the West. His army was equipped with American weapons. But the cavalry was still reminiscent of the Ottoman Empire. Iran was a focus of Cold War maneuvering, though bordering the Soviet Union, its Abadan refinery supplied Western Europe. In 1946, Iran's Prime Minister Gavan had met Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov in Moscow to negotiate the departure of Soviet troops. At the same time, he re-established his country's suzerainty over Azerbaijan and Iranian Kurdistan. One of the great landowners, Mohammad Mossadegh, now proposed the nationalization of the Anglo-Iranian oil company. The people were enthusiastic. He became Prime Minister in 1951 and acted on his proposal. With the help of the Shiite mullahs, who opposed foreign economic interference, Mossadegh won wide support from the Muslim faithful. Britain retaliated with a boycott of Iranian oil. The British fleet in the Persian Gulf made sure it was observed. Mossadegh traveled to New York to plead his case before the United Nations and to obtain an American loan. In vain, the Eisenhower administration was concerned about the Tudeh, the Iranian Communist Party, which, after having attacked Mossadegh, had now decided to support him against the United States. In August 1953, General Zahedi deposed Mossadegh with CIA assistance. The anti-Shah demonstrations were put down by the army. Mossadegh was arrested, then put on trial. Although ill, he vigorously defended his policies. As a result, he became a symbol of independence and opposition to foreign interference in the Middle East. In Egypt, Farouk was thinking along similar lines. In 1951, the Egyptian government abrogated the 1936 treaty that gave Britain control of the Canal Zone. There were demonstrations in Cairo. As a result, 75,000 British troops were sent to guard the waterway. The Muslim Brotherhood sent guerrillas to harass the soldiers. They, in turn, hunted down suspects and took repressive measures, only increasing the population's hostility. 
barbed wire was not enough to halt the process of decolonization. European families were sent home. In January 1952, the British raided the Bulak Nizam police barracks in Ismailia and rounded up guerrilla suspects. An outbreak of arson followed in Cairo. An underground movement known as the Free Officers now began to organize in the Egyptian army. Apart from opposing the British presence in Egypt, they believed the world had betrayed them with the creation of Israel. Muslim sheikhs and Copt priests joined the movement. In July 1952, the Egyptian army toppled the government. The revolutionaries were led by General Neguib, who was very popular with the crowds. But the real leader was Abdel Gamal Nasser. Farouk abdicated and went into exile. In Iraq, oil revenues had allowed the Hashemite monarchy to expand public works. In May 1953, Faisal II was crowned in Baghdad, but the Iraqi opposition denounced the government as corrupt and repressive. On the same day, Faisal's cousin Hussein was crowned king of Jordan. He was only 17. The West was now confronted with increasing nationalist movements and anti-imperialist attitudes all over the Arab world. The US Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, was able to make his presence felt. But did the old British lion still have enough teeth to hold the Suez Canal? In spite of the political turmoil, Cairo was undergoing a population explosion and an economic boom. The people were in a mood for change. Like most of the population, Nasser came from a rural background. As head of state, he began agricultural reforms that redistributed land to the peasants while weakening the social dominance of the great landowners. Tradition was challenged in other ways too. Nasser suppressed the Muslim Brotherhood while women went on hunger strike to demand equal rights. In July 1954, the United States pressured Britain into signing an agreement under which British troops would leave the Suez Canal within 20 months. The Egyptians were ecstatic. The British had occupied the zone since 1882. Now they were going home. In spite of his one-party rule and assaults on tradition, Nasser was becoming the hope of the Arab world. His radio station, Voice of the Arabs, was followed from the Gulf to the Atlantic. There was fresh fighting near Gaza, reminding the world of Arab-Israeli tension and the fate of the Palestinians. To avoid new humiliations, Egypt needed modern arms. Where would she find them? Nasser refused to join the British-sponsored Baghdad Pact of Middle Eastern Nations, but in April 1955, he attended the Afro-Asian Conference in Bandung. There, President Sukarno gave him a starring role. Nehru, at the height of his fame, advised non-alignment. As for weapons, Cho Enlai advised Nasser to seek Soviet help. The deal was done. The USSR increased its influence in both Cairo and the Middle East. From June 1956, the Soviets supplied the Egyptian army with Czech-made weapons. Nasser also planned to build a dam at Aswan to irrigate, electrify and modernize the nation. The West refused to grant him a loan. So he decided the canal would pay for the dam. On July 26, 1956, Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal Company. 
For Egyptians, the nationalization restored their nation's honor. In London, the British and French proposed that the canal be declared international. Nasser rejected this attempt at international colonialism. On October 29th, Israel attacked. For the Israelis, the nationalization and Egypt's rearmament were too much. Two days later, the British and the French launched their own attacks, supposedly to stop the Israeli-Egyptian conflict. But their real aims were different. Britain simply wanted the canal back. France, fighting a colonial war in Algeria, wanted to punish Nasser for assisting the Algerian rebels. The Anglo-French explanations to the Security Council were not impressive. Their first attacks came from carriers and airbases in Cyprus and Malta. The Israelis seized the Gaza Strip further humbling an already humiliated people. Moshe Dayan was in the Sinai. He accepts an Egyptian general's surrender. Israeli soldiers proudly displayed captured Soviet material. On November 5th, British and French paratroops were dropped on Port Said, where the canal meets the Mediterranean. A seaborne invasion followed. While Soviet tanks were finishing off the last of the Hungarian rebels in Budapest, the British and French armies were fighting for Port Said. Egyptians replied by scuttling ships to block the canal entrance. Ferdinand de Lesseps' statue was blown up. The last drop of French paratroops exasperated the United States and fed Soviet propaganda in the Middle East. By November 2nd, the United States had convinced the UN General Assembly to demand an Israeli withdrawal from the Sinai and a cessation of hostilities. Golda Meir agreed. The British and French had no choice but to agree as well. A UN peacekeeping force arrived to separate Egypt and Israel in the Sinai. The UN troops were acclaimed like liberators. For Egypt, military defeat had become a political victory. The Israelis evacuated. The British and the French soon followed. Their failed gamble would hasten the decline of the colonial empires. Nasser had become the hero of Arab nationalism. And from Port Said and Alexandria, the Europeans were going home.
General Qasem was executed in February 1963 after a Ba'athist coup in Baghdad. The new president was Abd el Salam Aref, but he leaned towards Nasser and soon purged the Ba'athist elements from his regime. In spite of this, the Ba'ath party came to power that March in neighboring Syria. Salah Bita, the Syrian prime minister, prudently re-entered Nasser's fold. After disturbances and political unrest in June 1963, the Shah of Iran expelled the Ayatollah Khomeini, and he majestically received General de Gaulle in October. With his oil wealth and American support, the Shah wanted Iran to become a strategic focal point from its frontiers on the borders of the Soviet Union and Iraq to the mouth of the Persian Gulf. Khrushchev countered this by cultivating Egypt. Nasser spoke of Soviet imperialism and had the communists arrested, but released them in 1963. In May 1964, he greeted Khrushchev in Alexandria before traveling to the Aswan to open the first stage of the Great Dam. His Soviet guests declared that Egypt was busily building socialism. Khrushchev's last official trip was a resounding success. Waters of the Nile were rerouted. Whole Nubian populations had been displaced, and the ecological effects were unknown. But Egypt was counting on an increase in irrigation and an abundant supply of electricity. And Nasser needed a success to deal with a resurgent Muslim Brotherhood. Would Israel ever know true peace? Many Israelis hoped for detente with the Arabs, but the most extreme Zionists still had not accomplished their goals for a greater Israel. On their doorstep in Gaza as elsewhere, the interlude gave the Palestinians time to think as well. The Palestinian Liberation Organization was founded. Leaders like Yasser Arafat were sustained by the common revolt against misery. In addition to the conflicting solutions sponsored by the United States and Soviet Union, General de Gaulle offered his own contribution. La Cinquième République s'était dégagée vis-à-vis d'Israël des liens spéciaux et très étroits que le régime précédent avait noués avec cet État. Et la Ve République s'était appliquée, au contraire, à favoriser la détente dans le Moyen-Orient. D'autre part, une fois mis un terme à l'affaire algérienne, nous avions repris, avec les peuples arabes d'Orient, la même politique d'amitié, de coopération qui avait été pendant des siècles celle de la France dans cette partie du monde. Bien entendu, Nous ne laissions pas ignorer aux Arabes que pour nous, l'État d'Israël était un fait accompli et que nous n'admettrions pas qu'il fût détruit. Nasser made a show of his Soviet weaponry to hide his economic and political difficulties. But constant Arab bickering, Palestinian terrorism and Israeli raids against Syria exasperated everyone. In May 1967, a parade in Israel commemorated the creation of the state. Nasser asked for the UN troops on the Egyptian side of the border with Israel to be withdrawn. General Secretary Utant agreed. Israel mobilized. Nasser blockaded the Israeli port of Eilat. King Hussein of Jordan signed a defense pact with Egypt. Pour éviter les hostilités, la France avait, dès le 24 mai, proposé aux trois autres grandes puissances d'interdire 
conjointement avec elle, à chacune des deux parties d'entamer le combat. Le 2 juin, le gouvernement français avait officiellement déclaré qu'éventuellement il donnerait tort à quiconque entamerait le premier l'action des armes. Israel attacked on June 5, 1967. Moshe Dayan was the new Minister of Defense. Israeli pilots, highly trained, used the element of surprise to annihilate Egyptian aircraft on the ground, then Jordans, then Syria's. The Arabs lost 418 aircraft, the Israelis only 26. Badly informed by his intelligence services, disconcerted by both his army's deficiencies and his enemy's plan of attack, Nasser was appalled by Israel's popularity in the West. The Israeli Air Force flew continuous missions, opening the path for the tanks. Egyptian and Arab communications were in disarray. The Israelis rushed to Gaza and pushed on towards the Suez Canal, which they reached after an intensive tank battle. The canal itself would be closed to navigation until 1975. On the Eastern Front, the Jordanians suffered heavy losses. The Israelis broke through and took the old city of Jerusalem. The streets of the city, whose name is a symbol of peace, ran red with blood once again. Moshe Dayan led his soldiers to the Wailing Wall. The whole of the Sinai Peninsula, with its oil fields, was occupied. In the north, the Israelis stormed the Golan Heights and expelled all the inhabitants except the Druze. The Six-Day War ended on June 10th. Israel was triumphant from Mount Harmon to the Sinai, from the Suez Canal to the Jordan River, and the Arab armies were destroyed. Israeli flags dominated the ramparts of the old city of Jerusalem, which was annexed on June 28th. The old Jewish quarter would be restored to house Israelis. And as in other occupied territories, there were expropriations. Near the Wailing Wall, houses were torn down and their owners scared away to increase the esplanade leading to the wall. During a press conference on November 27th, de Gaulle declared, Israël ayant attaqué, s'est emparé en six jours de combat des objectifs qu'il voulait atteindre. Maintenant, il organise sur les territoires qu'il a pris l'occupation qui ne peut aller sans oppression, répression, expulsion. Et il s'y manifeste contre lui la résistance, qu'à son tour, il qualifie de terrorisme. Arab hopes were kept alive by boycotts and a resumption of guerrilla warfare in August 1967. The Israeli government declared that it would deal only on a state-to-state -state level, thus excluding the Palestinians who had no state. But the Palestinians were now more than ever the heart of the problem. The war and the occupation sent a new wave of refugees fleeing to Jordan. The UN counted 350,000 new refugees in the Jordanian camps. The very isolation of these people strengthened their identity. The occupied territory on the west bank of the Jordan called Judea and Samaria by the Israelis, remain Jordanian under international law. The already numerous Palestinians had a high birth rate. 
they kept up close family and financial contacts with those who had fled. Crushed by defeat, NASA appeared on television on June 9th. In a choking voice, the great orator announced his resignation. He was still speaking when a cry went up from thousands. Gamal, Gamal, don't leave us, we need you. He stayed on as head of state, but Marshal Amer was arrested, as well as the heads of the secret police. Amer committed suicide. There were pro-NASA demonstrations in Algeria as well. Strengthened by his popular support, Nasser attended the Arab summit in Khartoum. The Arab heads of state refused to negotiate with Israel from their position of weakness. To save Egypt from economic ruin, Nasser accepted aid from his former rival, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. Conservative and shrewd, Faisal had steadily built up his country with oil revenues. In November, the UN voted for Resolution 242, which called on Israel to evacuate occupied territory and for mutual respect between states within secure boundaries. The Palestinians were training hard. If their leaders had learnt one thing from the war, it was that they could rely only upon themselves. The camps became paramilitary training bases. The PLO was made up of several factions. In both Jordan and Lebanon, it established administrations as if it were a state within a state. In March 1968, after a terrorist attack, Israel struck back at the camp of Karama in Jordan. The Fedayeen were hit hard, but managed to hold off the Israelis with the help of Jordanian army artillery. Arab morale was buoyed up by this feat of arms. In December 1968, after an El Al plane was hijacked, an Israeli commando unit jumped out of a helicopter and destroyed 13 planes at Beirut's international airport. They used French weapons. De Gaulle immediately imposed an arms embargo on Israel and said that France had always been Lebanon's friend. After using every possible delaying tactic, Nasser finally accepted an American plan for the evacuation of the Sinai. But the Israeli government also stalled. Meanwhile, a lone arsonist set fire to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which stands on the site of the old Jewish temple of Jerusalem. The fire enraged the Muslim Palestinians, thus ensuring further repression. Their plight troubled all the Islamic nations. Hassan II of Morocco organized the first Islamic conference in Rabat in September 1969. Its permanent seat was later set up in Saudi Arabia. Times of trial were coming in Jordan. King Hussein had secretly been in touch with various Israeli ministers. He now accepted an American plan for reconstruction in the demilitarized zones. The plan was strongly opposed by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, led by George Habash. In September 1970, this organization hijacked several aircraft. Neither Nasser nor Arafat could prevent the inevitable result. The Jordanian army attacked the Palestinians and expelled them from the country, despite an apparent compromise signed in Cairo on September 27th. Exhausted by this last setback, Nasser succumbed to a stroke the following day. It was only 51. His funeral ceremony was as impressive as he was. Israeli raids several months before had restored all his former popularity. His failures and mistakes typify the difficulties of a nation having to modernize in record time. Egypt had a population of 19 million in 1947, 31 million in 1966, and 56 million in 1991, all concentrated in the Nile Alley. 
Nasser left his people with a memory of national pride recovered and an unaccomplished dream of Arab unity.